fiat all that mess. Give me a billion of this, give me a billion of that, give me two billion of that, give me five billion ants, two billion aphids, I don't know, whatever he's making, make a wholesale. Let there be that. Now, ooh, but now when God gets to this creation, oh, he stops. Oh, he stops. And he doesn't just say, fiat a whole bunch of men. No, he made one man. He went down, oh, it was so sweet, and just took up that one little handful of Adama, which is what they call the earth in, in Hebrew. So he took the Adama, and as he was forming it into the man, he he spired his spirit into it. There's another thing where it's not really great about English, is we say breathe. It's nicer if we use the Latin, is that he, God inspired his spirit into the man. And he made just that one man, this was the unique thing, most like himself, he took the time to make him, he put more of his love, he put more of his self into it. He didn't blow into snakes. He blew into the man, okay? So the man is a very particular thing. Now, something else is we want to remember is that the man is not really two separate things. The man is, a, is an integral fusion of two things at the same time, which primarily are, are we think of them as, as two things because, I think because of sin in the world, the people die. And so you see the body lie there and, and something is missing. That thing that is missing is the spirit. So we think of the spirit's one thing, the body's one thing. No, 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 no. The, the spirit and, and, and the, the body fuse into a complete human being. And it's only because of the consequences of sin we, we even have to sit here and discuss bodies and souls separating. It's so perverse. Now, we have got to this point, as we know, it said that Adam was lonely. So the first thing God said is, well, let's have find a, uh, find a partner for you. So he paraded all the animals in front of Adam, and Adam said, I'm sorry, Lord, none of these are going to do. <laughs> and so then I love what God did. Oh, it's so romantic. You know, everything about this romantic when you get down to it. Oh, it says that then the Lord cast a deep sleep over Adam. Oh, and then, and while he was sleeping, God reached in and took out, ah, ah, ah. Oh. <laughs> and then the interesting thing is now, is before he does anything else, he closes the man up. Now, what can you tell me about Adam if God has closed him up while he has taken away his rib? What can you say Adam is what? Oh. Mind the rib. <laughs> Adam, here's the term. Adam is incomplete. Oh. Okay? Adam is incomplete now. So, then it says that God uh, uniquely made that one woman out of Adam's rib. And where's my rib? Oh, dear Eve. She got this pretty little eye, cute little kissy lips. Look at the luxuriant hair. Look at the figure. <laughs> okay. Now, now we have to kind of re rejoin Adam a little bit here. This is Adam now. Okay. Adam is really, really happy with Eve, and it's the sweetest thing that he says, and it's so true. He says, "Where is it?" Well, you know, do wonder if I can find these things. So on the next page, so, 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 so. once everything's highlighted, then nothing is highlighted. <laughs> um, uh, there it is. And he brought her to the man. I love it. He brought her to the man. It's like saying, I'm this, I'm giving her to you. And I mean, it was just like that. When, man, when, when, when I knew I was, was going to marry my wife, it was just going to say, dear God, you have given me this one, just like you gave Eden to Adam. And it had that same subtext behind it. You're not good enough for what I'm giving you, so try to measure up, because this is more than you deserve. But, you know, but isn't God like that all the time? You know, whatever you think you need, you get it in space from God. So, and then dear Adam, he's so sweet. This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Oh, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. And the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And I love that last line. That is the last line of, of an ascendant process in the first two chapters of Eden. Ever Eden. Genesis. Everything gets better, 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 better. And the last words before the serpent and the ruination of creation is that the man and the woman were both naked and they were not ashamed. And I love that because even though sin ruined this beautiful situation, we still pull that God still lets us have that little bubble of that pre 
that pre-fall Eden relationship between the man and the wife is, yeah, we're still naked and we're still not ashamed. That little, that little bit of, of perfect creative joy still persists for us outside of, outside of Genesis. Um, now, here's the next trick question. What was the last thing that God created? Was it Adam? That's a trick question. No. Yeah. And remember, now, the further you go along the, 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 the line, what happens? The, the later you're created, what does that say about you and God? You're more like God. Exactly. And men know this. And that's why men do this. They put the women up on a pedestal, see, because they're higher. And that's what, that's what I think what all men, all men do that. You know, they, this wife is like more than I can love. I mean, it's like every year I'm having to say, dear God in heaven, I never knew I could love somebody this much. I never knew somebody could be this beautiful. And, and, and I'm looking up and admiring my wife like 24 hours a day for 27 years. So I know exactly what this is like. Now, here's the next thing. Here's what God says now. Does anybody? Come on, somebody tell me quick. What's the first commandment? No. What's the first commandment? Trick. Trick question. What's the first commandment? What? Be fruitful and multiply. Yes, that's the first commandment. Oh, Moses is another 20,000 years down the road. So forget about Moses right now. Yeah. The first commandment was be fruitful and multiply. It's so romantic. Because the thing is, and I love this, is, is here's God. He created Adam. He created Adam out of the Adama. And then he made this dear creature out of his rib. Now, let me ask you, Adam, I, let's put it in my terms, I was incomplete till I met my wife. How do I complete myself now? How do I complete myself? I'm incomplete, I'm missing my rib, how do I complete myself? It's not difficult. Procreate. Yeah, first I get my wife, and like I love to do this even, is, is like she'll be cooking dinner or something, and I'll come and I'll hug her right up against where my, my rib is presumably taken from, my heart side. And I'll hug her and I say, oh, baby doll, I got my rib back. I feel so good. Yeah. <laughs> this, thing, this is interesting about men versus women. This is my lousy opinion. But you know, 12 hours will be full of it. Is, is, that, is that women, God made Eve complete. God rendered Adam incomplete. And so Eve doesn't have, she's complete. She doesn't have any need to go chasing after Adam. She's, God made her complete. Adam has to go chase after Eve because he's incomplete. And I think that has a lot to do with the nature of men pursuing women and the, and, and, and the men need to go get that. They need to go get their rib back. They can't just sit and say, well, my rib's going to come to me in a year now. No, 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 no. You go get the rib. You get the rib. And I remember I never pursued a woman like I pursued my wife after we went out one time. Um, and it's like, wow, that was one of the best times I had in my life. And so we don't go out again. Okay, we'll go out again. Okay, we'll go out again. Okay. And, and the joke is that I said, man, when, when, when I really found out who you were, I, like, I launched myself and my wife like a cruise missile. I mean, it was just like, bam! Boy, I had to get that rib back. You know, I feel so complete and so relaxing. I just love it to death. Now, <laughs> now that we know all this important stuff about, about anonymity and stuff, then actually, I want to put it this way here. Actually, the top of creation is not Adam and not Eve. God said, be fruitful and multiply. What is the highest thing that God created? Marriage. The highest thing God created is marriage. That's the peak of his loving creation. Is, is God takes a man and a woman. Now, here's the other deal. I love this. How many women did God make? One. How many men did God make? One. If there's going to be any more people, how's that going to happen? Yeah, they're going to have to make love and make some more people. Exactly right. And, and I, this is terrific. This is how God dignifies marriage. Is he, he says, I, I give you my procreative power. The most important power I have is the creative force of love. I, I, I deed that. I cede that to you. If you, don't, if you are not fruitful and multiply, if you choose not to, not to have children, there will be no more people. I will not interfere. I love you, and I give you this great gift, and it's yours to use or it's yours to misuse. And I read this, and I, I got this out of um, Humanity Vitae about 25, well, right around the time we were getting married. I would just look up about, oh, it's heard about Humanity Vitae. I heard about it, never read it. And, and so I read the dog, and I think I thought my brain was going to explode. One of the things it says is that, is that the man and woman, the husband and wife, are co-creators with God in bringing forth new life. And it's like, oh, dear Lord, completely revised my worldview. I mean, my wife all of a sudden looked like this incredible thing 
that, that was not true until I understood the dignity that, that we were co-creators with God in making people. It's like God says, God, I remember I always thought it was the three of us in a marriage. I always imagined it's like God saying, why don't the three of us make some more people? And it was just so romantic. And, you know, we had some babies and all that. That was pretty swell. So <laughs> this is up at the peak. All right. Now, of course, if they, if they obeyed uh, the fruitful and multiply, then you've got to have some little knuckleheads. And there's some. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they're happy. Okay, now, this is the key. Now, I've got to change the scale of this a little bit. Let's see. Oh, uh, like this. Okay. That's like the ground. And here's our little graph. I'm just going to turn it down like that. And then God's up here somewhere. Now, and the human beings are up here. And they're in such a good mood. There's one of them. All right, there he is. Now, when he looks down at all this other creation, how does he feel? How does that make him feel? Pretty good. Yeah, pretty doggone good. As it turns out, maybe it made him feel a little bit too good because the thing is, is while well, the distance from here down to the bottom is, is not all that far, the distance from here up to God is infinite. But you know what happens is people want to think that, well, you know, me and God, we're like this. We're like bosom buddies and all the scum of the universe is down here and I don't have anything to do with that. No. Even though God gave him all these gifts and all that love, he's still able to, to misuse that as much as he wants to. Now, let's see, where am I? Ooh, yes, now we have to jump again. I have to skip. I've got to interrupt that for a little bit. Where are we? Yes. Now, does anybody know what this is? Let's see, this is a difficult math question. Let's see. Uh, what is it? Anybody know what that means? Well, four, two, one, two. Yes, genius at work. That's how I went to college. Okay. <laughs> Actually, we don't even we don't even need we don't even need the the, the, the one genius. Four Q equals G. Okay. Now I have my reasons. I'm going to do it this way. People have have trouble seeing it work that direction. G equals four Q. Now here's a question. If, if I'm just going to say G W is water. So I'm saying one gallon of water is four equals four quarts of water. And of course, this number. That never changes. That's always four by definition. And so it's true that one gallon will always equal four quarts, but how about this? Uh, does a gallon of water equal four quarts of rocks? No. no. <laughs> These are easy questions. Okay. <laughs> a gallon of water is like water. Okay, so for, for an equation like this to be true, what has to be true about what's on both sides of the equation? Same. They have to be the same. Y'all are getting smarter by the minute. Okay. <laughs> Now, uh, you might be familiar with this equation, which has everything to do with, with being Catholic. Trust me. Hmm. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Right. Now, this is not really a complicated equation, although it looks just a whole bunch of letters and not really any numbers, and that always causes people stress. But the first thing is, is the speed of light squared, as we know, is a humongous number which you don't have time to write on the board. And it's a constant, so pay no attention to the c-squared. It's just a constant, just like the four for four quarts. It's a constant. And so over here is energy, and it's saying that energy equals mass times a really, 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 really big number. And most people who understand this in terms of atomic power is that if you took a, you know, you take some hydrogen or you take some uranium and you make it blow up, it's like, oh my goodness, it's 10,000 times more powerful than a ton of dynamite or, or what have you. That's all fine, that's all interesting, that's what we're really here to talk about tonight. No. It took me a long time to figure this out. But what's compelling about this to me is that it's saying that energy is the same thing as mass, which is saying that energy is the same thing as stuff. And you know, for up until Einstein, people thought there's energy over there, there's mass over here. They have nothing in common with each other. Mass is acted on by energy, but there's like a probably a fixed amount of mass in the universe and a fixed amount of energy, and they're, they're, they're two separate boxes. No. What Einstein was saying is that no, these energy and mass form a continuity. It's very interesting. Here's something that he said. By the time I'm going to read from something else, this is Einstein said this. It followed from the theory of relativity that mass and energy are both but different manifestations of the same thing. Um, he goes on and gets kind of technical for a minute, which we don't care about. And then he says at the very end is that, is that the mass and energy are, were actually equivalent according to the formula. In other words, what's happening is that, is that if you take energy and you compact it 
like with, with power that we can't imagine. You shove that energy, you make it so dense, it becomes matter. And at the same time, it's the same way that if we break an atom, we take all that tightly wound up energy which, which expresses, which manifests itself as stuff, as matter, and it, it, it ceases to exist as matter and becomes energy again. Now, what does this have to do with what we're supposed to be talking about tonight? I think it has everything to do with it. Because I was asking myself, I'd say, what is that energy? What is that energy of the universe that when bundled up so tightly becomes matter that then it's like it's like all my little my fingernails, my body, the floor, everything is made of this is, is made of quote matter, but the matter is made up of nothing but energy. And so then it's like, well, what is the energy? Because we know that God that it was that God created the world the world with his own energy, his own power. And this is my little thesis for the year is that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, and this is what it ultimately equals, is that the energy of the universe is nothing more than God's love. In other words, the, the energy of the sun, the energy of everything, all the mass of our bodies, everything is simply, that's just like God's raw, beating, powerful, burning love for everything, and that's what the universe is actually made of, which is why when God made everything, Everything was good because it was actually made out of his love, literally made out of his love. Now, there's no way to measure that. You can't go, we're going to invent a love-o-meter, and we're going to aim it at the sun. That's going to tell us how much of God's love is at the sun. We're never going to figure something like that out, and probably Adam and Eve wouldn't either because that probably requires God's knowledge. The second thing is that we're sinful people. Our eyes are blinded by sin. Our existence is blinded by sin. There's this huge veil over us. God knows that we can see 2% of what's really around us. Now we're going to... All sin-wrecked people, we're going to make some sin-wrecked instrument. We're going to look through it and try and figure anything out about God. Forget about it. So, <laughs> this is like an operative, an operative theme for me. The, the, the way I look at the world, the special way to look at the Catholic Church, the way the Catholic Church looks at the world, is that, is that the, the ground driving force of, of the universe is actually nothing more than, than God's love. I always think of love, it's like matter. Like, like the blackboard is just incredibly densified amounts of God's love. Why did God take all this energy and pack it down to where it manifested itself as energy? I don't know. But, but that's what he did. That's how the world works. Now, that kind of gets back to, to Adam a little bit because Adam was made out of matter and he was made out of spirit. But the thing is, is and we tend to want to think of them as separate things, but if... If, as Einstein tells us, but the mass is just a particular, just a different manifestation of the energy, then it means that a human being is actually this continuity of God's creative love. And part of that human being is manifest as matter, like our bodies, and the, and the rest of it, which who knows how, what, what proportion that is, a, a, a thousand part spirit and one little, one little tiny little speck of, 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 of physical matter, we just don't know. But the human being is, is, is this and this, but these two things are the same, and I'm thinking, I'm saying that these two things are the same as that. So we are actually nothing but, but made up out of God's love. And this whole idea about things being manifest is kind of interesting because there's some, some philosophers say that, that when you look at a human being is that you see his body, what you're seeing is the physical manifestation of, the, of a human being in the physical world. This is how you perceive a human being in the physical world as you see his body. But the rest of the human being is not quite that perceivable. One reason, again, we're blinded by sin. But he has this whole spiritual aspect that, that just doesn't show up to us because we just bonk. We just don't see that very well now. And this has a lot to do, I think, with the way, for example, the, the Catholic Church looks at, at the universe. And for example, in this case, what I'm driving at also is if, if all matter is simply tightly little bundle wads, wads of God's love, love, then everything is sacramental. God runs through everything. Everything is made out of God's love. So the thing is, is the same way that, that I would say that my, my wife is kind of functions sacramentally to me because I love her, and the older I get, the more I, th the more, the more I love my wife, I'm loving the invisible things about her more and more as I begin to perceive them more. And, and so what happens is that my wife's body becomes increasingly a symbol of, of the completeness of who she is that I kind of generally sense better and better, but it's, it's never, you know, I, I can never just say, oh, look, I see all that shimmering yellow stuff. That's your soul. I don't want to see that for so long. You know, that will never happen. But that's, that's what's going on. And for everything in the universe, everything that we see, every other human being, God is like, is like mediating through them and bursting out through them. It's like everybody's got God bursting out of them if they let it happen. And that's because we're all part of that same continuity. Every single thing is made out of love. Now, especially for Catholics, this matters with sacraments. Because why shouldn't 
Why shouldn't water wash away sin? It's in the nature of water to do any good thing that God wants the water to do. If God wants the water to 